he will make a masterpiece out of me. Um, anybody ever put a puzzle together before? How many? I worked on a thousand piece puzzle the other day. One of my other days, a few months ago. Right? And it took me several weeks to get it done. Um, and one of the things that I, I realized is that, you know, when you're working on one piece, it can seem a bit uh, obscure. Right? Some, some aspects of the puzzle, some pieces seem obscure, you're not really sure where it fits. But if that, if that piece is missing from within the puzzle, then the full picture doesn't look proper. It, it, it doesn't look good. And so I'm glad that that song speaks so much to me that I know that God is painting a beautiful picture in my life, and I'm sure that he's doing the same in your life. And, 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 and if you don't think that he is, just wait a little bit longer. Like, if you're going through a trial, or, or some sort of challenge or some sort of difficulty at this point in time, just hold on a little bit longer. Like, I can tell you from first-hand experience, now, understand what I just said, not second-hand experience, not just talking about somebody else's story, but I can tell you from first-hand experience that he's creating a masterpiece out of me. All right, if you just believe it. And so I'm grateful for this opportunity. Thank you, Pastor, for allowing me to share with your young people. Can we just uh, say amen for the young people of this church this morning. And, and I'm, I, I pray that the, that the sermon this morning is something that will really bless you all as young people. Um, even, I don't care how old you are, you're still a young person. Uh, none of you all are as old as Methuselah, I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. So you're still fairly young. So everything that we'll talk about this morning applies to you. But, but this is one, some of the things we'll talk about this morning are things that I had, I wish I knew at a younger age. I wish I had understood this at a younger age. And I pray that it blesses you. Father God, as we get ready to, uh, to, to jump into your word, as we get ready to hear from on high, it was said earlier that, uh, that, that, that your people have come to hear me speak. And I just want to correct that a little bit, Father God. Like, I really have nothing to offer your people this morning. But the great news is that you have everything to offer your people this morning. And so I'll just allow myself to be used as a vessel to speak to your, to your young people and your older folk, Father God. Most importantly, I ask, Father God, that you would speak to me also, Lord. Don't, I, I pray that I would gain something from the message this morning, Father God. We ask your blessings. We ask for your spirit to dwell upon us in the most holy name prayer. Amen. Amen. So now, as a young person, one of the things that I realize is that um, we tend to like control. And, and one of the challenges that we have is when our parents are speaking to us, we feel like we are no longer the ones that are in control anymore. Right? We have to observe the rules that our parents have laid out for us. And we sometimes, we don't really, and, and, and truthfully, if we're truthful, our parents sometimes can do a better job of explaining why they're giving us these rules. Right? But I know that some of you all have experienced your parents saying to you, listen, um, just do it because I said so. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. And, <laughs> and the challenge that we have is as you become more and more mature, just somebody saying to do something just because they said so, you can't really handle that anymore. Because you've had some knowledge now, you now have some experiences, and you know that if somebody's giving you a rule, there has to be a deeper understanding, something deeper. There has to be something at the foundation of why they're giving this thing to you. And so when they fail to give you that explanation, as a matter of fact, when we go through things in life and we can't understand why we're going through them, like, it's, it's a challenge. We as human beings, we like to understand the, we like to know the, the, the answer to the question, why? <laughs> We like to understand the answer to that question. And so one of the challenges, like, again, one of the challenges that we have is that when we don't feel like we're in control, it, it, it's a scary feeling. Now, speaking to some of the older folks in the audience, um, how many of you have experienced driving with somebody who we would name a backseat driver? Right? GPS. GPS, right? And, 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 and watch this, because some people are raising their hand talking about others who are backseat drivers. But if you're truthful, there are times where you have been the backseat driver. All right? So we're going to ask that you stop. Don't lie to the rest of the church this morning, okay? We want you to tell the truth. You have been a backseat driver. And the challenge when you're in, when you are the passenger in a car, one of the challenges that you have 
is you're seeing certain things from your perspective. And so there looks like there's danger around the corner from your perspective. If you're, if, you're, if you're getting ready to make a turn, there are certain things that you're able to see and you're assuming to yourself that there are certain things that, that the person next to you cannot see. <coughs> and it requires a bit of faith when you're a passenger in a car. Why? Because you have to trust the fact that the driver is able to see something that you can't see. And the driver knows what he's doing or she's doing. And, 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 so, and so you are putting your trust in the, 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 the vision and the control of the driver. And what you have to understand is that the life that we live, the life that God has given us to live here on earth, we sometimes think that we're the driver. And we have forgotten that, that God has said that although it is your life, yes, technically true indeed, but although it's your life, you are still the passenger in your own story. And the actual driver is Christ. And so what Christ is asking for us to do, what, what I believe, if you, if you read a lot of the stories of the Bible, is what he's asking us to do is to give up the limited perspective that we have for the full perspective that he has. Amen. And that's going to require for us to lose some control. And, and, and while most people would say, listen, you need to take control, I, I, I want you to believe and trust and have faith that in this particular life that we've, we've been given, in this particular scenario, if we allow ourselves to lose control and give control to Christ, every, like somebody said the verse earlier today, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, and above all that you could ever ask or think. Which means that while you have control, there's certain types of success or certain places in your life that you think that you're going to be able to attain to. And what God is saying is that whatever you're thinking, I can raise you a little bit higher. Amen. I can raise you a little bit higher. So watch this. We jump into this text and, and we'll start with Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Mark chapter 10 and verse 17. I'm going from the King James Version. Amen. No, this is going to go blank. Once and so reading here, it says, And when he was going forth into the way, that's there it's, came it's one good. running, and kneeled to him, and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now, we call this particular gentleman that we're talking about by a particular name, usually when we refer to him. Anybody know that name? The rich young ruler, okay? So it says that he came... He he was going forth into the way. There came one running, that's the rich young ruler, and kneeled to him, him being Jesus, and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And then verse 18 says, And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. There's an interesting dynamic that's going on here, because the first thing that happens here is that we see that this, this young person comes up, as a matter of fact, we call him a rich young ruler, which means that he's had certain success in life, which means that he knows a bit about what it means to be a, a leader. He knows what it means to have authority. Uh, he knows what it is to be in control and to give directions to others, right? But now all of a sudden he finds somebody else that he can identify with who also seems to be a person who has some kind of authority, who is also a leader. And one of the things that he does is, his, if, if you pay attention to the story, his words and his posture show that he pays homage or that he respects the leadership of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it says that he kneels before him and he calls him good master. But we know that as the story develops, he calls him good master, but, but the actions that he's going to show later on in the story shows that even though he calls him good master, we're not sure if he really believes that he's a good master in his heart. Because I would submit to you that Anybody who you would consider a good master, or anybody who you would consider a good mentor, or anybody who you would consider a good leader, if they tell you to do something, you would follow their leadership, you would follow their instructions. And we're going to see in the story that he fails to follow the instructions that Jesus is going to give him, okay? So watch this. His behavior in response to God shows that he doesn't really see Christ as master. And watch this. This is why that's so important. We're talking about a belief system. And we're talking about what does this rich young ruler really believe about Jesus Christ? And watch what happens. Watch what happens. Watch what Jesus, these are the words that Jesus said, right? He said, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. 
Jesus is really right here challenging not just his belief system, but a belief system that the Jews had at that time. And the reason why he's doing so is because he knows that what you believe will affect the way you act. And what you believe about something will determine the actions that you're willing to take. As a matter of fact, how many of, how many of you are sitting down in your chairs right now? Now, raise your hand if you asked the chair if it was going to hold you up. You didn't ask any questions about the chair, right? Why? Because you automatically believe that, that when you saw the chair, you said, this will hold me up. I will sit down because the, I believe the chair will hold me up. If you didn't believe that the chair would hold you up, what would you do? You would ask some questions, right? You would have cause to pause, all right? But because you believe that the chair will hold you up, you are willing to go ahead and sit down in the chair without asking any questions. And what I'm trying to tell you is that the, Jesus is getting at a belief system. Jesus is trying to really question this rich young ruler. Do you really believe, when you call me good master, do you really believe that I am good master? Because if you do, then what I'm about to tell you, you would be willing to follow. And watch this. Watch this. It goes even deeper than that because when you talk about good, and he says there is none good but the Father, in essence, what he's asking the rich young ruler, he's saying, do you really believe that when you, do you believe that I am good in the same way that God the Father is good? Do you believe that? Why? Because at that time, there's a verse that says, um, um, the, Lord, the Lord your God is one. That was a very prominent text in the Jewish religion. And so it was hard for them to really believe that this person, this, this being that they looked up to as God, which was distant and far away, would become a man and dwell among them. All right? So, so, so you have to understand that when he's, when he's talking to Jesus, the, the other Jews around are saying to themselves, like, we can't really believe that this man calls himself Christ and that he is God and that he is equal to God. And Jesus is saying, if you see me as good, then what you're really saying is that I'm equal to God, which means that you can trust what I'm going to tell you. Are you really willing to believe that? Are you really willing to believe that, all right? So just hold that in your thoughts as we continue, okay? So then we go on to verse 19, and it says, Thou knowest the commandments. The challenge that we have sometimes, right? Some of you all may not be Seventh-day Adventists in here, but maybe a lot of you are Christian, right? And for the, those of us who are Seventh-day Adventists in the building, we suffer with this problem also. And most people of any religion really struggle with this problem. And people, really the world at large, struggles with this problem. And the challenge that we have as Christians is that because we've grown up and been studying our word and have been coming to church daily, well not daily, but weekly at least, we've been reading our Bibles daily, I hope, we've been fellowshipping with other believers, the challenge that we have is that we feel like we have nothing to learn. And can't nobody tell you anything. Right? Why? Because, because you feel like you, you know it all already. And so one of the, sometimes the challenge that I have as a young 32-year-old is that some, coming from New York, the challenge that, let me say that because maybe it's not the same struggle everywhere. But in New York, the challenge that we have as young adults is that we're still often looked at as little kids. And truthfully, if, if, if I'm truthful with you, sometimes there's a reluctancy to give young adults in New York uh, uh, positions of leadership because the view, the, the, the challenge that people have is that what do you really know? What could, what could you really teach? Right? And so, and so what, I, what I want us to do is not to think that we already know everything but that God is still a God that is revealing things to his people even now. Amen. Right? And so watch this, watch this. So, 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 so here's another challenge. In the text, in verse 20, when he says, and he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Right? The problem that we have here in the text is the very thing that, the, the, the very fact that all these things he has observed. And the challenge there is this. It takes me back to the book of Exodus when the commandments were first given. And the response that the children of Israel had after God had given them the, the Ten Commandments was this. All these things we will do. And the challenge is that, 
the, the, the problem, and we find this problem throughout the whole Bible, really, is that the, 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 the main problem that man has is that they try to keep the commands of God in their own power. All these things that you have said, we will do. And what Jesus is trying to say is like, listen, like you, you think that you're doing it through your own power, but let me tell you, as long as you're doing it through your own power, you're not really doing it. You're not really doing it. And so while there's some things that are going to develop from the text, and so all of a sudden we get down to Mark chapter 10 and verse 21, and it says, Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. Now the weird thing about this text is that even though Jesus says one thing thou lackest, if you really break it down, he says like six different things in there. All right? And I'm just like, Jesus, what's going on? Okay? But, but he says one thing thou lackest. But now, let, let's take a look at this, all right? The, the one thing that I want to point you all to is that Jesus beholding him loved him. And that everything that Jesus gets ready to say to him comes from a place of loving him. All right? It comes from a place of loving him. And now watch this. The challenge is he should actually get out of love. He's getting ready to tell the rich young ruler some things that the rich young ruler would actually rather not hear. And so the challenge that you have today is that sometimes we say that we love the folks that are around us, but do you love them enough to tell them something that may make them upset with you? And listen, I'm, I'm not even talking about, I'm not even trying to get deep on y'all, and I'm not even talking about uh, 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 just, just preaching to them or what happened. But if they have some challenges, if you see them doing some sort of wrong, and you know that they know better, are you willing to step to them and say, listen, there's some things that we might need to correct, but, and, and you might not appreciate me for calling this thing out, but out of love, I'm going to tell you something that needs to change. Are you willing to do it? Because we're talking about ministry here, right? T telling people what needs to be adjusted, the adjustments that they need to make in order to experience the fullness of life that God would like for them to have. Amen. Right? Or some of y'all, the, the way, uh, and truthfully, I suffer from this sometimes. I might see somebody walking around, they might be talking to me, they might have something in their teeth, but I might be a little reluctant to let them know that they have something in their teeth. Right? But, but, but if I love them enough, maybe I would tell them that they have something in their teeth. Right? So maybe I have some work to do also. Okay? But, but, but everything that Jesus is getting ready to say comes from a place of love. And so he says to them, again, one thing thou lackest, but he lists six things. And so I was thinking about, I was thinking about that, like, okay, God, what are you saying through this? What, what, what messaging are you trying to get to us? And so the first thing that he says is to go thy way. Go thy way. Now, understand this. Let me, let me, let me talk about this a little bit. The challenge, again, that the rich young ruler has is that it's actually a, a, the same challenge, but it's twofold, right? In the first sense, he has learned how to take care of himself because he is a rich young ruler, which means that he has learned how to provide for himself on a carnal level. Understood? So he, so, so he does not necessarily have to rely on anybody to make provisions for him. All right? he, know, he He's able to pay his bills on his own. He is able to provide food for himself and his family on his own, right? He knows how to do business. Like, he's able to take care of himself as a human being. He's able to do well for himself. But the challenge that the rich young ruler also has, which Jesus is trying to address, is that the rich young ruler thinks that he, has, he is able to take care of himself because he is able to keep the commandments. And because he has been keeping the commandments. Right? And so, and so what Jesus is trying to do is he's trying to get and he's trying to chip away at this false notion that this man has been living with. Alright? And the first thing that he says is, go thy way. Go back to what you know already. Go back to how you've been living. Go back to how you've been operating. Right? I need you to take a look at it. I need you to assess it. And I, because there's something that you need to learn from it and then there's going to be something that you need to do. Watch this. The second thing that he says is, now that you've gone back to your way, now that you've gone back to what you know, now that, you, now that you've gone back to the way that you're used to operating, this is what I want you to do. I want you to sell what you have. I want you to sell what you have. And so, and so, and so watch this. I want you to sell this idea that you are able to take care of yourself through your own works. I want you to sell that idea. But I was like, okay, God, you want him to sell that, and then you want, and you, you, 
want him to sell, what, what happens when you sell something? And I was like, okay, God, I'm, I'm wrestling with this. And I said, okay, if I have something and I sell it, that means that I have given it to somebody, right? But then I should get something back in return, correct? Because if, if, if it's one thing if I gifted that thing to somebody, correct? It's another thing if I've sold that thing to them. And so when I, when I was like, okay, God, what are you trying to say? And I said, okay, if I've, if I've sold it to them, if I, on a natural level, because remember, he has great possessions, right? So let, let's, let's use the example of his car. If he sold his car, then he would expect to receive back some sort of finances back for selling that car, correct? But I was like, well, God, what, what happens if he sells this false notion that he's past spiritual? Like, what, how do we deal with that? What should he be getting in return? And the thing that God revealed to me was that once he sells this notion that, that of, of him being able to handle and, and, and provide for himself spiritually, what he's going to get is Jesus. <laughs> and what I realized is that a lot of people, we, a lot of us struggle with having a lot of commandment keeping and we still struggle to have Jesus. Still struggle to have Jesus. And why, why is that so important? Why is that so important? Because the very next thing that he says is to give to the poor. He says to give to the poor. And watch this. If we're just thinking on a natural level, then give to the poor means because we really we usually think about this from just a natural level. So we want you to give to the poor. What do we mean? Sell the possessions that you have and give money to the poor. But what, I, what I'm submitting to you today is that Jesus is like, I have another level to that though. What I want you to do is I want you to sell that notion that you have. And once you sell that notion, you're going to receive Jesus. And now you're going to have exactly what you need to give to those who are poor in spirit. Poor in spirit, right? You now have, because, because if you give them, if you just give them command, we're talking about ministering to people now, right? If you just minister to them and give them commands, but you have not given them to Jesus, you have failed. Yeah. And so at the heart of what Jesus is trying to do is say, listen, listen, don't, like, the commandment keeping is good. I want you to continue keeping the commandments. It's all well and good. They are, they are great for your life. But if you have missed the point of giving people Jesus Christ, then you have another thing coming. And so he says, give, give, give to the poor, right? Because that's what you get. Give them what you have gotten after you have sold that old thinking that you have. And then he says something else. He says, come. Come. And what he said, when, when, when he says come, he's in, it's an invitation. He's inviting him now into a new reality. And what this reality says is that your, 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 your sustenance, your success in life, the, 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 your, you being able to live a good life will no longer be based on what you can do, but it will be based on what I can do. And what, and, and, and what you have to understand is that the, the beautiful thing about that is that, one, again, our belief system, if we believe that Jesus is all-powerful, and if we believe that Jesus is all-knowing, and if we believe that Jesus is all-good, then that means that he has some perspective that we don't have. And that means that the, 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 there's some, maybe there's some traffic down the road, we were talking about driving earlier, but maybe there's some traffic down the road that we're not, we, like, we're not privy to because we can only see from our limited perspective, right? And Jesus is like, yo, listen, if you would just let me direct your life, I will help you to avoid the traffic. I will, if, if, if you would just lose control and submit all that control to me, like, I will make sure that you get to your destination unscathed or at least with limited uh, 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 hurt, right? But sometimes we cause our own hurt, we cause our own pain because we have not allowed him to direct us. And so watch this, and so then after, after he says come and invite you into this new, into, into, into uh, a, a new reality, a, a, a system that operates under a brand new set of principles, the very next thing he says is take up your cross. And, 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 and the, like I said before, sometimes there's pain that we cause ourselves, which is foolish. But we can trust and believe that when we take up our own cross, there might still be painful moments. It's not necessarily an easy thing to do. But what we can trust and believe is that if it's at least the stuff that God has destined for us to go through, we can come out of it okay. We can come out of it okay, all right? And so, and so he says, and, and not only that, but I want you, when he says take up your cross, there's something that interesting I said. I said, notice that he doesn't say take up my cross. And he doesn't say take up somebody else's cross. And one of the challenges that we have is that, is that we expect that our lives will all look 
exactly the same. And we look, we look to other people's lives sometimes and, 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 and listen to this young people because this will help you as you continue to grow and you can why it's so important to follow Jesus Christ because if, if you don't, then you will miss out on the specific life that he has for you. And the challenge also is this, if, if you miss out on the specific life that he has for you, then that means that we will also miss out on the specific life that he has for you. What do I mean by that? that I, what I mean by that is that there is a specific thing that he would like you to do in this world. There is a specific role that he has designed for you to play. And when you don't accomplish it, we all miss out. Right? Because if you pay attention to the Bible, all rev sometimes revelation was given to just one person, but it was for everybody. Okay? So, so, so there's something specific that he would like to do through your life. And we, I know I sure don't want to miss out on what he's going to do through you. And then the last thing, the final thing that he says is follow me. Okay? Follow me. And, and here's, here's, here's the, 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 this is the reason why we have a problem losing control. And this is one of the reasons why we often look to other people's story in order, and thinking that our story should be just like this. Because when Jesus Christ says follow me, how do you measure follow me? It, you can't measure that, all right? What I mean when I say you can't measure that is, is it's easy to measure if you just look at commandments and think that you're doing good because it's like, okay, okay, I have this checklist, boom, check to that, uh, I'm keeping this out, check, uh, I, I haven't killed anybody, check, I'm not stealing from anybody, check, uh, uh, um, or what else, I honor my father and my mother, check. And you think that you're doing all well and good, but Christ might be saying to you, well, listen, all right, the, the Ten Commandments are all well and good, but what I need for you to do is I need you to leave your job right now, but you'll have a challenge doing that. I, I want you to change your major at school, but you might have a challenge doing that. What, what, what God is saying is like, listen, like, what Christ is saying is I might step to the left, and you're keeping the commandments, but are you willing to step to the left when I say to step to the left? You're keeping the commandments, but when I say to step to the right, are you willing to step to the right when I have told you to step to the right? Are you willing to follow the lead? Are you willing to follow my, my instructions that I'm trying to get to you as an individual? Are you willing to do it? Or are you scared? Like, like, like watch, watch. Again, do you really believe that I am the good master? Or is that something that just sounds good when you say it? Or is that something that you just say because you're supposed to say that thing? Are you, are you really willing to trust me? Hmm? When I say for you to, okay, listen, don't date that person over there. Date this person over there. Are you really willing to do it? Hmm. Hmm. Hmm? Follow me. It's, 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 it's something that's very hard to measure. Why? Because we don't have all the answers and we don't have the full perspective that God has. We still see through a glass darkly. <laughs> And so, and so, and so, and so, all of a sudden we get to this point in verse 22 where the rich young ruler really says that, and he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And listen, when we, when we talk about great possessions, we, like, forget the material stuff, right? The material stuff is easy, right? His great possession was his ability or what he thought was his ability to be holy in and of himself. Right? His ability to be in control. And then all of a sudden we get to verse 23 and it says, and, G and, 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 and watch this. There's a point in this, in, this, in this set of verses that we usually stop at, but, but if we just kept on going and continue going forward, there's something beautiful at the end, right? And I, I, I want to get to that point and paint that picture for you. So in verse 23 it says, and Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Again, don't, don't just think, uh, don't just think about the material things. Think about spiritual riches. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. It is, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished 
out of measure. Right? Imagine that. Astonished out of measure. Like, this was something that blew their minds. Saying among themselves, who then can be saved? And Jesus looking, looking upon them said, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. Right? So, so, so watch the, this is another thing. Again, Jesus is challenging the belief system of the time, which if you understand anything about the, 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 the Jewish culture at that time, if you were a person who was rich, watch this, if you were rich and increased with goods, it seemed like you were okay with God. And what Jesus is saying is that forget about even just being rich and increased with goods at, on a material level. Some of us as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, as a matter of fact, we are rich and increased with goods spiritually. Laodicea. And like, like I said, right, we, we, we think that we know it all, right? So it's hard for us to learn some new stuff, right? And so, and so because we're rich and increased with goods, the, tr the, the, the problem that we have, again, is that Jesus is like, listen, if, if you could keep on believing in your ability, then it's impossible for you to get to heaven. But thank goodness we have Christ who's like, listen, if you just come with me and submit to me and allow me to lead, I'll make that way for you. I'll make that way for you. So watch this. Watch this. If, if we jump on down, well, not jump on down, very next verse, verse 28, says, and this is so beautiful, and, and this gave me so much encouragement, all right? This gave me so much encouragement. Okay, then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee, which is a correct statement. They, they really did do that. And then verse 29 says, And Jesus answered and said, Very I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my sake, and the gospels. But he shall receive an hundredfold, now in this time, all right, now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. And what I believe, what I believe that, 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 that Jesus was trying to say at that point was this. You, you, you are trusting in your own limited way, not understanding that if you would just submit to me, I have stuff again, like I said before, that you, your mind can't even fathom what I will do for you. And I'm not just do for you once you get to heaven, but what I will do for you in this life. In this life. And, and, and the question is, Jesus said it, but do you believe it? Because some of us, if we really, if we are really honest, the way we operate our lives, we operate as if we don't believe Jesus will bless us in this life. And we and we we, we only see Jesus as being somebody who, who is here to punish us in this life, but not here to bless us in this life. Alright? And, and and watch this again. Follow me. So 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 give enough control. I, I don't wanna and I have, I'm glad that God just reminded me to do this, because I don't want to to go through this whole sermon without making it a bit more practical and a bit personal, right? So, so understand that when you talk about being a pastor, it's still weird for me to see the word pastor behind my name. Okay? Why? Because it was never my intention to become a pastor. Alright? So, 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 I remember in my freshman year, uh, at the end of my freshman year at Stony Brook University, this is back in like 2003, and my friend's mother said to me, listen, Vaughn, you need to become a pastor. You need to go to Oakwood University. Well, it was college at the time. You need to go to Oakwood College, college and do a degree in theology. And I'm like, no, that's okay. <laughs> that's, that's okay. I, I understand what you're saying, but, 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 but that's okay. Like, and, and, and I ran from that for years. Ran from that for years. And I really believe that some of the challenges that I had in my life since then were as a result of not allowing God to lead. So can I continue making it practical? Is that okay? So 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 what I'm talking about is that instead of trying to instead of hearing his voice, I continue through my and continue to matriculate from Stony Brook, Stony Brook University. I graduated in 2006, right? Graduated with a, a degree in political science. Okay? But graduated with a 2.3 GPA. Now if you understand anything about 2.3 GPA, when you're getting ready to go through a recession a couple of years later, a 2.3 GPA means nothing when there are people out there who are unemployed who have 4.0 GPAs. Alright? Other thing that happened. Next thing. I married a young lady. Soon after going, getting into the marriage, I found myself going through a divorce. Right? 
right? And, and, and once again, all I think because I did not follow what Jesus was trying to say. I, I was trying to do what I thought was good for God, and God was like, listen, if you would just follow the call that I had put on your life, like, there's some better results would happen for you, right? And so then all of a sudden, the, the, the very next thing, I have to, through the marriage, we had children, okay? But soon after the children are born, all of a sudden I find myself getting laid off from my job. Right? Now taking care of twins with no job is pretty difficult. Listen to this. I still wasn't trying to become a pastor, but eventually, right? It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. But eventually I'm like, hmm, you know what, God? I feel like I should go back to school. And okay, I'll go to school and I will do a master's in some sort of divinity or pastoral uh, type field. <coughs> So, okay, I, I started off at Liberty University out here in Lynchburg University, and I transferred over to Oakwood, right? And the beautiful thing about it is that, and, and I really believe that God is like, listen, if you would just follow my lead, I would give you the success that you're looking for, right? And so, and so all of a sudden, I found myself at Oakwood University, and I eventually graduated from Oakwood University last year with a 3.8 GPA, right? As opposed to that 2.3 before, right? Y'all remember that, okay? So, so not only that, watch this, I graduated and still had no intention of becoming a pastor. <laughs> so watch this, and, and, and y'all see what God is doing in my life currently. So last year summer, I was at RBC in Bowie, Maryland, and one of my, a, a pastor there and his wife started a conversation with me. I didn't even know who they were. And he said, listen, he, after they struck the conversation with me, they said, hmm, based on some of the work that you're doing, we believe, it seems like you should be a pastor, but you've been running from it. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> I was like, hmm, you might be right. You might be right. So he said, listen, this is what I want you to do. I want you to send your pastoral resume out to all, all the conferences in America. <laughs> and I'm like, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> this does not make sense. I have no intention of pastoring in Alaska. Why, why would I send my, my, my resume there? I have no intention of, although Hawaii is beautiful, I don't have any intention of going and moving to Hawaii. Why would I send my pastoral resume there? So what I did is I sent it to the places that kind of made sense, right? My kids live in Maryland, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll stay in the Maryland, Virginia area-ish. I'm from New York, we'll send New York, Connecticut, those places make sense, all right? Those places make sense. And so all of a sudden, a few months later, literally in October, last October, he checked, he, 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 he contacted, contacted me through Facebook, and we spoke eventually on the phone, and he said, How, how's that search been going? And I said, listen, Pastor, to tr be truthful, I have to tell you, I've been disobedient. Big sense in my own life. And so I said, listen, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to follow through on what you told me to do, and we'll see what happens. Literally, I'll watch this. By that Wednesday of that week, this is in October, I forgot, it, I forget, it's like the first or second week in October. By, by that Wednesday, I had sent it everywhere. Even places that I couldn't send it out electronically to, I just mailed it to me. All right? Two days later, that Friday, I'm in the barbershop. In the barbershop, there happens to be uh, one pastor, one of the pastors from RPC was in there, and he was having a conversation with another man who I didn't know who, who that was in there, right? But it turned out that he was a pastor. Now, they're talking about becoming an author, and I'm like, hmm, I don't really jump into conversations, but since I'm an author, I'll jump into this conversation. So we start talking, we start talking back and forth. By the end of that conversation, and some of y'all know who this man is, Dr. Roland J. Hill, says to me, listen, young man, if you are not doing anything like specific at RPC, I would love if you would come down and help me to pastor my churches down in the Culpeper and Maranatha area. This is two days after I finished doing what God had been trying to tell me to do, right? And so, and so, watch this. My, my, when I began hearing the voice of God, when I, when I stopped trusting in my own understanding, right, and stopped trying to do things my way, and I said, mm, God, you're trying to say something to me, then I will follow you, I will follow what you're saying, all of a sudden, God started to allow things to, he started giving me the success I had been looking for. And some of y'all, some of y'all, uh, dare I say, might be missing out on some of the success that you've been looking for because you're not allowing God to be the one to manufacture that thing. 
And so we're talking about, about following, and we're talking about giving up, and we're talking about <laughs> sacrificing, right? Uh, losing control. And watch this. I, I'll leave you all with this. This is something beautiful that you will find at the end of this, at, at the end of this, um, uh, this story. So if you go to verse 31, it says, For many that are first shall be last, and last first. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him, and the third day he shall rise again. Watch this, and I'll leave you all with this. It, 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 when God showed this to me, it was just such a beautiful image, right? Here you have a story of a man who didn't want to give up anything. But all of a sudden we get to the text and we all of a sudden see Jesus who had everything up in heaven and he gave all of that up and yet still was still about to give up more. Right? We, we have a man who said that, listen, I, because of love, I will give up my very life. And watch this, because of love, Lord, I, I don't even necessarily want to go through this right now, but, but if there is no other way, I, I wish that this cup would pass from me, but I'm going to allow myself to lose control and allow God the Father to have control. And, 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 but, 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 but the reward that he was seeking after was great enough for him to lose that control. And so Jesus has set the example even for us. He said, Jesus is like, listen, I didn't even have control over my whole life. He went through his whole life saying, listen, I will sit the, submit the control that I could have to the Father. And so what I'm, my, my challenge to the young people of all ages in this, in this very room this morning is, is think about where are you still trying to hold on to the control of your life? Where are you still trying to create your own success? Where are you still trying to be righteous through what you can do? And my challenge to you today is to submit yourself fully to God. Hear His voice, not, not just His general will for us collectively, but begin hearing and seeking Him for the specific things that He would have for you to do. That will allow your life to be the unique life that He has designed for that thing to be. And so follow God, I will make an appeal to your people. Simple appeal. If there are some people who feel like they would like to take upon the challenge this morning to lose that control, even though it might be a, you might have some hesitations, it might be a little bit frightening, but if you are willing to take up the challenge to lose control, then I'm inviting you to do something simple, nothing complex, nothing hard, but I'm just simply asking that you would raise your hand. If you would like to take up that invitation that God says to come and just lose control and give him the full control over your life. Father God, your people have raised their hands. And maybe some can't even raise their hands, but in their spirit, they may have raised their hand, Father God. Or maybe some, they're not sure whether or not they should raise their hand. They're still, still wrestling with the challenge of, of giving up the control, Father God. I ask that you would touch each and every heart, mind, and soul underneath the sound of my voice, Lord. We all want to experience everything it is that you have for us to experience in this life, Lord, Father God. And not only that, but, but, but we want you to give us uh, testimonies where we have no choice but to say, God did it. Where we have no choice but to say, listen, listen, I, I can't even take credit for the life that I live, for the excellence that you see in my life, because all I did was I submitted everything unto God, and God worked that thing out in a way that I could not even have fore foreseen myself. And I'm asking that, 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 that we would not be so selfish, Lord, as to think that we could do it in and of ourselves. I, I'm asking that we would not be so selfish to, to deprive the world of the unique thing that you would like to color this world with through our story. But Lord, I, 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 I don't, I don't, I, I will not be the one here to act as if it's the easiest thing to do, Lord. It's not. Sometimes we, we're seeing, we're, we're, we're in the passenger seat, Father God, and everything in us is 
wants to say, uh, uh, Lord, like, press the brakes, Father God, or Lord, speed up, or Lord, like, change lanes, Father God. And sometimes we forget that, that not only do you have, uh, not only do uh, we sit in the passenger seat, but that you have the rear view mirror, you have both side view mirrors, and you have the perspective, you have all the perspective in the world, Father God, stuff that we can't see with our limited perspective. And so my prayer simply this morning, Father God, is that one day when you come back and we are all fellowshipping together, that the story will be said, and as I hear the stories of your people, that they have submitted themselves wholly unto you. That they have not chosen to walk away like the rich, like the rich young ruler did, trusting in what he could do for himself, materially and spiritually, but that they have fully trusted in what Christ is able to do for us. And now we ask that, 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 that your spirit will rest in us and confirm the word that you have given us this morning, I pray, Father God, and that we will teach other men and women to also submit their lives fully to you. This is my prayer in the most holy name, Father God. Amen. Amen.